We are live. Good evening. It's uh, 530, so we're going to get this started. This is uh, the City of Batavia Mahoney Creek Stream Assessment. My name is Andrea Pedraza. I'm the Assistant City Engineer for the City. And um, the City hired HR Green back in February of this year. Um, when we originally started the project, it looked a little bit different as far as how we would be communicating with you. We had anticipated having a bunch of neighborhood meetings in April and um, collecting information from all of you residents along the stream that way, but we had to alter things with COVID and send out the survey. Tonight, we're going to do our educational piece and some findings from the survey as well as um, assessments of the stream. And on the line, we have from staff Rahat Bari, who is the city engineer, Gary Holm, director of public works, Laura Newman, the city administrator. Um, from HR Green, Logan Dilbertson will be presenting, and Ajay Jane and Scott Marcourt are also on the line. And from AES, who is also working with um, HR Green, we have Steve Zimmerman and Cecily Coons. Um, that's the introductions. I'm going to turn it over to Logan and Steve, and they're going to go ahead and do the presentation. Um, but real quickly on your chat, it tells you how to go ahead and ask questions. If you do have questions, we're asking that they all be held till the end of the presentation, and there will be a raise your hand bar. Um, and at that point, we can unmute it. And you can also put information in the chat bar as well, and we can respond at that time. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Andrea. All right, so uh, this is Logan. Hello, everybody. And uh, today we will be presenting our findings of the Mahoney Creek study and uh, quickly discussing some of the work that has been completed to date. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, we will have an opportunity to answer all questions at the end. Uh, okay, and then today's agenda. I wanted to go over, before we really get into anything, what we're actually talking about. Um, first of all, I wanna let you know what the goals of this study actually are. Then we will begin by discussing the history of Mahoney Creek, which I always find is very interesting to uh, residents who live along the stream. Uh, discuss briefly how streams function, go into our findings of the stream assessment, and then discuss the results of our residential survey, which many of you have received and quite a few responded to it. Then we will briefly discuss some potential improvements, example projects and things that could be done along Mahoney Creek and go over the next steps of this project. So the goals of the study. What are we really doing along Mahoney Creek right now? All right, as Andrea mentioned, we completed a stream assessment to document the existing conditions of the stream. We also went through and identified potential improvements that could be made to mitigate any areas that we noticed needed some attention. This study is also prioritizing the improvements based on need, accessibility of a project, and also whether or not funding would be available. Certain types of improvements are at a higher probability of getting grant funding. Uh, we're also looking into identifying grant funding and also sources of money that can be applied to uh, improvements along the stream. So now let's get into that next part of this presentation, the history of Mahoney Creek. All right, uh, I like to do these where we go back and look at some of the earliest information that's available from the state of Illinois. Uh, in this case, they are the plat maps from 1840. So these are pre-settlement. Uh, 180 years ago, surveyors came through the area and they laid out the township section ranges, also county lines and things like that. When they came through, this was mostly before any town was really established. So on the screen here, you see the Fox River identified. You also see this meandering black line right here. This is Mahoney Creek as it was surveyed 180 years ago. Also, I like to see on here is uh, what were the conditions like in the area? Uh, the surveyors will note typically whether it was swamp, whether it was prairie. Um, in this case, it was identified in the red box as timber. 
uh, we now refer to that mostly as a savanna or a woodland. But you know, it's good to know that back before anyone came here, this area was predominantly forested. Another thing I would like to point out on here is that there is only Mahoney Creek here. Uh, Mahoney Creek's tributary, which flows to the uh, southeast, or flows from the southeast to the northwest, is actually not shown on here. Um, the surveyors who did this mapping, I can promise you, I haven't found a stream yet that they've missed. Uh, most of them are actually man-made streams that we'll find out in a minute here. So back in 1840, when those surveyors were walking through the watershed, these are examples of what they may have been seeing. Uh, nice open oak savannas, open prairies with native vegetation and wildflowers. And Mahoney Creek likely had a very healthy base flow, clear water, and native vegetation right up to the water's edge. The next bit of historical information that we have available is the 1939 aerial. These are also available from the state. So this is taken, uh, it's 80 years ago about. And we've gone through here and outlined where Mahoney Creek was in this image in orange. And I can also give you a few points of reference on here. Uh, this is Pine Street right here. Uh, Wilson right here. I believe this is Forest Ab Avenue. and um, Right about here is uh, Shanahan Grove Park. So you notice that a few things have changed since this was all just timber. Uh, downtown Batavia is starting to develop. You have more streets, you have homes being built. There's a bridge over the Fox River. We also have pretty heavily reduced forest land. These little dark areas on here with the black dots, those dots are all trees. They're mostly oak trees because that was the uh, primary species that was in our area back in 1840. And I did point out uh, Shanahan Grove Park because that was maintained full of trees and a lot of those trees are actually still there today. And actually I, I want to point out there as well is that we now have Mahoney Creek's tributary. Uh, so this wasn't available in the 1840 images, but this shows us that Mahoney Creek's tributary was likely constructed as an agricultural farm ditch. A uh, long time ago, farmers used to dig these ditches. Uh, sometimes they still do today. And they were used to dewater the soil around them so that you could convert what would have been a wetland or a prairie or forest into agricultural land. We so see here that it was a little network of branches up there and then predominantly pretty straight heading to Mahoney Creek. So Mahoney Creek's tributary, being a farm ditch, historically may have looked something like this. Relatively straight, pretty uniform cross-section, and the only meanders or bends in it would have been naturally occurring due to erosion. Right, uh, now, what does Mahoney Creek look like? So over time, a lot of the stream has actually been moved from its historical alignment or channelized. Uh, the historical stream alignment from that 1939 aerial is still shown in this image as orange, and its current day location is shown in blue. So you can see a lot of these spots right here by Radent um, and through Shanahan Grove Park, the creek is an entirely different location than it was historically. Downstream of the uh, flow control structure in uh, Shanahan Grove, and right through here, the stream's in the exact same location. It's a very healthy part of the creek. There are also locations, such as up here by the Johnson Woods Detention Basin, where the stream has likely just naturally meandered and moved over time. Now, a few other things that have changed are that the watershed now is no longer timber and agriculture. It is mostly residential and industrial. So this means that there is increased pavement, more buildings, and as I mentioned, the stream has been straightened out in a lot of spots. There is less meandering in the channel. What exactly is the Mahoney Creek watershed as well? Uh, currently in 2020, the Mahoney Creek watershed extends following this black boundary. But what that means is that any rain that falls within that black dotted boundary 
eventually finds its way into Mahoney Creek or the tributary, whether that be flowing over land or through a storm sewer. The total area draining to the point down at the Fox River on the left over here is about 2.03 square miles. So that's like 1,300 acres, it's a pretty big area. We have residential land, industrial land, and then out here in the Fermi Lab property, we still have some bits of uh, restored prairie draining into it. So seeing the history of the creek, what has actually changed? As I noted, we have an increase in impervious area. This means there's more pavement, parking lots, streets, houses, buildings, and that translates to more stormwater runoff when it rains. We also have storm sewers draining that pavement. So that means that water that falls onto pavement goes into the storm sewer and it goes directly into, in this case, Mahoney Creek. So that means that less rain is soaking into the ground. We also have these sewers in the ground. We have storm sewers, sanitary sewers. Um, the way that these pipes are placed in the ground is that they sit on a bed of gravel. So if you've ever dealt with uh, the footing drains in your house, you know that water will follow gravel seams. And this can actually, as development occurs, lower the groundwater table. We have more detention basins. So detention basins come along with the um, development of land as a flood mitigation effort. And what that means is that now you have a longer flow time through your creek as these detention basins drain out. We also have had sediment coming from construction sites. We have abundant turf grass in the watershed. Um, and with turf grass, you typically apply uh, herbicides and fertilizers. A lot of that can run off and find its way into Mahoney Creek. And lastly, as I mentioned, the roads. Roads in the winter, they require salt to keep them safe, but they also have cars that can occasionally leak oil or produce heavy metals from brake dust. So all of these things can lead to impairments in a waterway. All right, next on our agenda is to briefly discuss really how streams function. Um, I did not intend for this to be a lesson in geomorphology, so I'm gonna keep it very basic. Uh, a stream reflects the watershed that is draining to it. If you have a stream that is drained entirely, it's draining a big industrial park, everything around it is paved, there's no detention basins, the health of that waterway is going to be diminished because it's going to be prone to flash floods being that when rain falls on pavement, it runs off very quickly. If you have a stream that is draining areas that have big open prairies, lots of vegetation where water can slow down and soak in, that vegetation will also filter out any pollutants that get washed off the land surface, you have a healthier stream. A few other items here are that uh, stream banks, they will erode and the channel will downcut when there is an imbalance between the shape of the channel and the amount of flow going through it. So when you are seeing stream banks eroding, it's often a sign that there is either too much flow, too fast of a flow, or something is just out of balance with the waterway. Uh, sedimentation typically occurs, this is sandbars and gravel bars forming. If the channel is too wide and the water doesn't have enough energy to keep eroded sediment in transport. So Really, the things that you see with sedimentation and erosion are a waterway's natural process of trying to find an equilibrium where the amount of erosion occurring matches the amount of sedimentation that is happening. So it's washing sediment away, but it's also bringing it in and replacing it. Basically, some level of erosion is healthy, some level of sedimentation is healthy. Too much of either one is not always a good thing. All right, so now we're going to get into the stream assessment results. So uh, Steve, our ecologist and myself, uh, we walked every last foot of uh, both Mahoney Creek and the tributary. We started at the Fox River and walked upstream. And we divided the creek into what are called reaches. So a reach is defined as just a segment of a waterway that has very similar characteristics. Um, it could be that the whole thing is through a wooded area and has pretty uniform meanders, or 
A portion of the stream is all through residential backyards and is relatively straight. Um, just these are the things that are used to break up the stream into sections. Each of the sections was then given ratings based on its characteristics regarding the health of the stream in the surrounding area. Uh, you will hear me say the word riparian area, and that is just referring to basically the vegetated buffer, the plants that are growing along the creek. I have a couple photos here for you of some of our findings. So we did notice uh, a few items uh, relating to you know, debris jams. Um, these were pretty prevalent, and this is an example of one that ended up inside of a culvert. Uh, we noted some areas of very severe erosion, which is depicted in this photo here. Uh, this is one of my coworkers, and when we measured the height of this, it was about 16 feet, and it was nearly vertical in this location. Noted a lot of locations where uh, private property was being impacted by erosion of the stream. Some areas that were relatively natural looking, but did experience uh, bank erosion. Uh, lots of uh, private foot bridges with mowed turf grass to the edge of the stream, and also located a few uh, pipe outlets that um, were not on any maps or uh, we didn't know where the origin of them were. Uh, so a quick um, request for everyone who's listening is that if you do find uh, old old pipes like this that are draining into the creek, uh, please call the city and notify them of where they're at so we can come out and, and take a look at them and try to find out where they are make sure it's not um, an old sewer pipe or anything like that. Our assessment also did find a few locations where uh, storm sewers had experienced some uh, failure due to erosion at the uh, point where they drain into the creek. Another photo of that severe erosion here. And uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of these private footbridges crossing the creek. Um, one thing I would like to bring out, uh, to mention here is that uh, Mahoney Creek itself is regulated by the uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources and also the Army Corps of Engineers in addition to the, the city of Batavia. Uh, so if, if you have Mahoney Creek flowing through your property and you would like to build a structure like one of these, um, please reach out to the city. Uh, there is permitting that's required prior to doing uh, a project like this. Um, reason for permitting on putting in a small bridge like this is that uh, the creek itself needs to be able to convey floodwaters. So if we end up getting a lot of these bridges in the way, you can actually run into a situation where the creek is no longer able to pass a flood flow. Uh, we did notice lots, lots and lots of trees that were being undercut, such as this one here. And this is where the stream has actually eroded out from underneath the tree. And eventually um, this tree will fall into the creek and cause uh, more debris entering the waterway. Lastly, uh, just a general thing we noted across essentially the entire creek is that there is a lot of invasive brush and invasive species. And I'll, I'll talk about those more in a minute. But in addition to finding problems with the stream, we also found a lot of spots that were in very good health. Um, lots of them actually. Uh, this top left photo, is a section of the stream where the uh, bedrock is exposed. So these streams are not very common in Illinois where you have a bedrock channel and banks. They're extremely stable. You know, the water's flowing over stone. We also uh, saw the spot that's in uh, Woodland Hills Park that has been recently stabilized by the city. Um, had lots of locations where residents had been maintaining a native kind of natural buffer along the edge of the stream uh, rather than mowing uh, the grass right up to the end of it. So areas like this, such as at the confluence and right here in reach eight, um, that vegetation helps keep the banks in place and greatly minimizes the risk of erosion in those areas. Also saw some spots where uh, bank stabilization had been implemented and was working well. In this case, it was uh, boulders placed along the edge of the water. So what were the results of our assessment? Um, overall, we located uh, three reaches that had substantial severe erosion occurring. Uh, reach one down near the Fox River, reach five just upstream of Pine, and reach 11, which is just downstream of Wilson. Uh, moderate and minor erosion was very prevalent through
throughout the entire stream. Uh, but as I mentioned, minor erosion is not necessarily a problem. The riparian area, that forested uh, vegetated area that's along the stream was generally degraded throughout the entire stream. Uh, most of it was considered degraded or poor. There were a few locations where it was considered in moderate health. Uh, Reach 11 was the one that generally had the poorest health as it had a lot of debris jams in it, trees that had fallen in and collected more debris. Uh, it was purely dominated by invasive brush and there was a lot of erosion going on there. Reach 8, which is uh, just upstream of forest, was in the best overall condition. This flows all through private property and the residents there have been maintaining the stream very well. Um, so thank you, residents of Reach 8. Uh, the Mahoney Creek tributary, we broke it into uh, three reaches. Uh, similar to the overall main branch, uh, the riparian area was generally degraded due to invasive species. Um, and Reach 3, uh, right here, the upstream most one, just downstream of Kirk, was in uh, pretty poor shape. Um, it had a lot of utilities actually in, exposed in the creek. So this is uh, an area that may need attention in the future. Right, and as Andrea had, oh, I'm sorry. And uh, one thing that we did see throughout the entire area was that fish were identified in every reach with the exception of upstream of Michael Wild Park on the Mahoney Creek tributary. Uh, they were mostly pioneering species uh, people generally call them creek chubs. Um, but we believe the reason that they did not make it past Michael Wild Park is that the tributary, as it flows through the soccer field area there, is buried in a storm sewer pipe. And um, even though these fish are very brave and they do make their way pretty much up every creek, I, I think the 300 feet of sewer there was too much for them, so they didn't head up there. As I mentioned, invasive species were found in every single reach. Uh, but overall, on the days that we visited the stream, the base flow, the normal everyday water flowing through the creek was of very clear quality, very low turbidity, and uh, I was happy to see that. Now, as many of you probably know and uh, actually may have received this, uh, we sent out a residential survey to gather your input on how you viewed Mahoney Creek and its tributary. Um, this was mostly done because of uh, our inability to be able to meet in person and actually talk and hear what your concerns were. So this was an effort to try to gather input from you and incorporate it into our uh, recommendations. So overall, 442 surveys were sent out. We had 68 respondents, which are identified in green below. And approximately one third of the people who had Mahoney Creek either cutting through their property or immediately adjacent to their property responded. So that's a, a pretty good response rate um, with this survey. Now I'm gonna go into uh, a few of our findings on here. Uh, one of the first questions we had asked was, what are your concerns regarding your, your individual property? Um, this is predominantly if the creek actually flowed through your property. The items that had a higher response rate are highlighted in green here. Uh, so they included flooding, creek erosion, wildlife habitat, and trees. They were the four highest voted um, concerns on here. So in addition to actually doing some data gathering on here, I did read every comment that we received. Uh, a lot of the comments regarding the flooding and creek erosion were you know, concerns that when we had a big storm coming through, that the water would actually get up out of the channel and flood yards and streets. Um, most of the reports were not necessarily of a home flooding. So then one made me want to look into how many houses are actually located in the regulatory floodplain here. Uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, they have maps that show flood risks for lots of streams in our area. So we went through and looked and actually on Mahoney Creek, there are very few houses that are truly in the current mapped floodplain. Um, but you know, flooding was still a major concern. Uh, so we looked into some of the plat maps for the area and we found that um, much of the floodplain that FEMA has mapped for Mahoney Creek is bounded within uh, storm basin easements or drainage easements. These are shown here in the red. 
Um, so these easements extend beyond the top of the channel. These go basically to encompass that FEMA floodplain. And these are intended to be kept open to allow high flows from storm events to pass. So since these are easements, the city is granted the right to go in and maintain them if necessary, meaning if a, a tree falls in and it's blocking flow and causing flooding, they are able to go in there. However, they are not obligated to go in and continuously maintain these easements. So there, there is a, a difference between emergency maintenance and permanently maintaining them. Just a few more uh, examples here of where it did show that we had these stormwater basin easements and the blue in here is actually FEMA's uh, floodplain boundary. Okay, one of the next questions we asked were, uh, what are your concerns with the watershed as a whole, not just your own property? And we went through, tallied up those responses and we had creek erosion, upstream developments, water quality, wildlife habitat and trees as some of the most frequent responses from our uh, residents. Uh, when I look at these, I kind of lump them together and see them all tied together. I could see a resident saying, I'm concerned that upstream of me, a new parking lot went in. Uh, that's gonna produce more flow that comes down the stream and lead to erosion and degrade water quality, inhibit wildlife habitat and potentially cause trees to fall in the creek. Uh, so I, I put together a couple slides here going over really how these can be tied together. Um, now, wait, uh, okay, sorry. This isn't an exhibit of stormwater. This is actually um, flattening the curve with uh, COVID-19. So something's not right here. Um, this is better. Uh, all right, so one good thing about this pandemic and COVID is that it has taught basically the entire country about stormwater detention. Uh, the reason that I'm tying these together is that the red graph there on the left, that is essentially if you built a parking lot and you did not provide a detention basin, you get a quick plug of water coming off of it when it rains, and that can actually lead to erosion flooding downstream. But as I mentioned, when you build a new development, whether it be a neighborhood, a shopping center, or a parking lot, you're required to provide a detention basin. So these detention basins flatten the curve of flow that's going into the stream. So with detention, you're able to cut off that flash flood that would come off of a parking lot. Uh, so I, I just want to let folks know that this is something that um, occurs when development is happening upstream of you. And given the fact that many of the residents along Mahoney Creek live downstream of industrial areas, I thought this would be uh, an important thing to hopefully put you at ease a little bit if you see any development going on upstream. Okay, also in the residential survey, uh, we had asked, in your opinion, what are the things that are causing the negative impacts to Mahoney Creek? And you've already identified that debris, uh, these log jams, trees that have fallen in, and overgrown invasive vegetation are a problem. So we had overgrown vegetation and debris. Uh, much of this debris, it comes from a few sources, uh, dumping of yard waste, um, dumping of grass clippings, uh, log piles, but also when the stream erodes and trees fall in, uh, invasive vegetation is also linked in with that uh, trees falling in. So we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment here. All right, and one of the last questions we asked was, what is your overall opinion of Mahoney Creek? And overwhelmingly, you all thought that it was an amenity. Uh, this made us very happy to see this because this tells me that a majority of you actually care about the health of the stream and that you wanna help to maintain and improve this waterway. So thank you for feeling this way and thank you for uh, participating in this survey. So the next portion of this presentation is that I'm gonna go into a few example projects of uh, stream restorations, repairing area restorations and woodland uh, improvements that can be done. At this time, we have not formally identified any projects, uh, so nothing is formally planned right now. Um, we're in the process of proposing improvements that can be made within the watershed, and then we're now looking for funding options. 
but I just want to make it clear that these are examples of things that may be done along the stream in the future. So here is a uh, example of what a restored stream looks like. Uh, so this is a project that was completed by Applied Ecological Services, AES. Uh, they're our partner on this. And we have just a, a before and after picture of the same portion of the stream. So on the left, uh, this picture, you know, it, it could be Mahoney Creek. Uh, it's got lots of trees growing right up to the water's edge. Many of them are not native species and uh, bits of erosion occurring underneath the trees there. Uh, a typical stream restoration, they rely heavily on the use of stone and native vegetation, which is planted above that. These are uh, those prairie plants that are native to our state. These projects also will regularly include um, things that are called uh, ripples. These are strategically placed rocks in a creek. And the way that they're placed in certain geometries will actually direct the fastest moving water into the middle of the stream and prevent these high moving, highly erosive flows from coming in contact with the stream banks. So if you can keep the water in the middle of the creek, it actually helps to keep the banks of the stream from washing away. Another example, again on the left, I, I swear that could be a picture we took during our stream assessment. Um, this is a creek that had erosion, had lots of invasive brush, and then on the right, uh, this is it after it was restored. Um, you can see all of the invasive brush at understory has been cut away. In this case, they maintained many of the mature native trees and then restored native vegetation down to the water's edge. And again, in this picture, here are some of those riffles that are strategically placed rocks to direct water into the center of the stream. So the way that a stream restoration works is that they typically want to mimic through engineering design what nature would do if we had never gotten involved. Uh, if you look at a healthy stream, they will normally have a low flow channel that if you went out on any given day, that's where the water is contained within. That's where your base flow goes. And then in nature, you would have a floodplain that as the stream gets deeper, it's able to flow out onto the floodplain. And rather than continue to get deeper and deeper, it's able to spread out and slow down. That floodplain ideally is planted with prairie plants and native vegetation that have nice deep roots and they can help hold soil in place and slow that flood water down. So here's a couple pictures on the bottom of a stream restoration that's in process. Um, construction frequently does require selected or substantial tree clearing to be able to get in and access the site. Uh, during construction, heavy machinery is typically required as eroded banks, such as the ones pictured here, they need to be pulled back to a more gradual slope, similar to this uh, cross section of the creek here. Now, as construction progresses, the contractor, they typically place an erosion control blanket along the stream, which is shown here, this tan color, and they will throw seeds of native plants there. Uh, they also, a lot of time, will install stone on the outside of meander bends or anywhere that the stream is expected to be moving very quickly. So this picture is immediately after construction has been completed. But then about a year later, you start to see uh, some plants actually come up. Uh, native vegetation does not work the same way as the grass that you grow on your lawn does. Uh, if you reseed a portion of your lawn, you can expect to see something growing in as little as a week. Uh, native vegetation takes about a year to really start to look like something. Uh, seed mixes are mixed in with plants that do pop up quickly so that it's not just a brown site, it does turn green very fast. But the native plants with the wildflowers, um, those can take up to a year. And typically the second year, you have fully established plants and lots more uh, wildflowers occurring. Right, so I've been talking a ton about native plants and some of you may ask, why are these important? What's, what's the matter with the daylilies and turf grass that I, I currently have growing along the stream? So this exhibit, I believe this is from the uh, NRCS, is a really good example of why native plants that have evolved to thrive in Illinois are important. Uh, so what we have here is a scale on the left. These are feet 
shown there, and feet above ground, feet below ground. On the very far left here, this little line is turf grass, just regular what's in everybody's yard. Um, grows about four inches above ground, and the roots typically only go about two to three inches into the soil. Uh, native plants, on the other hand, such as, well, this example here is a compass plant, they can put the roots about 15 feet into the soil. Um, many of them, it's very common for them to go three feet or deeper into the ground. So why is this important? Uh, the fact that their roots go so deep means that when we have a drought, these don't necessarily need water. Their roots are able to get much deeper than your lawn into the ground to stay moist, to be able to survive through periods where we don't have a lot of rain. Additionally, when it does rain, all of these root structures will allow water to flow along the root and infiltrate into the ground much more quickly than shallow rooted turf grass. And then lastly, if these are planted along a stream on the banks and you have a high flow of water come through, that root structure is basically an anchor. It is keeping the plant in place. It doesn't let it wash away, but it's also keeping the soil in place underneath it. So these are all reasons why we really like to see native plants incorporated into uh, landscapes. Okay, uh, here's a few more examples of just restored woodlands. A uh, reason I put these up here is because, you know, Mahoney Creek, as I mentioned, used to be dominated by uh, oak savannas. So just sites that in the past likely had invasive brush where you couldn't see very far in any direction. All that has been cleared and then native plants reinstalled the way that they used to be before um, settlement occurred. Here's a before and after of one of those. Uh, and on the left, the reason I really wanted to show this is because that looks a lot like uh, Shanahan Grove to me. Um, so, you know, if we were to do a restoration in that park, um, it may end up looking something similar to the image on the right there where you can actually see into the forest, uh, there's sun getting down to the ground and you're able to actually have plants growing on the, uh, the forest floor. Okay. So if you have Mahoney Creek or its tributary flowing through your property, there are a few things that you can do to really help promote stream health and maintenance. Uh, the first thing and the biggest thing is please do not dump any yard waste, trash, anything along the stream. Uh, please do your best, this goes for everybody in the watershed, to manage your fertilizer use. As I mentioned, the rain that falls on everyone's lawn who lives in Mahoney Creek eventually makes its way into Mahoney Creek. And if you're using high amounts of fertilizer, that can enter the waterway and cause large algae blooms to happen. Uh, additionally, it flows into the Fox River and it can have algae blooms occur there. Um, if you have them, please remove non-native species. I've got a, a couple slides of those in a moment here. Uh, plant native vegetation where possible. Uh, you can mix it in with landscape beds or you can go a little further along and do uh, some bigger restoration areas. And then lastly, please remember that a natural meandering stream is a happy stream. Uh, you know, streams are meant to transport sediment. They do cause erosion and sedimentation but these are natural functions of a stream. And as long as they're in balance, it's not a, not a problem along the waterway. All right, here's an example of one of the spots that we saw along the stream on a, how to manage your, your stream bank. So as I mentioned, please do not dump leaves, grass clippings, any lawn debris, branches, that type of stuff adjacent to the creek. Reason for this is that when it rains and the stream comes up really high, all of this debris can get washed downstream and become a big problem for your neighbors. It leaves a big mess in their yards and it can actually lead to culvert cloggings and things like that. Also, this material acts as mulch. So if you use mulch in your, your landscaping beds, you know that one of the benefits of mulch is that it helps keep the weeds down. But along a stream bank, we want some vegetation to get the roots down into the soil to help hold it in place. And by dumping all these leaves here, after they wash away, it's just exposed soil. The next flood that comes through, that's going to be eroded. And also, um, please do not store any firewood or you know, materials adjacent to the creek, particularly things that can be washed away. 
uh, because firewood floats. And <laughs> this is a picture from this spring at the Cleveland culvert. And it, it looks like someone's entire uh, firewood pile got washed down there and actually started to clog up the culvert. Um, you can also see here in the foreground just examples of debris that it can collect in people's yards. And as I mentioned, as part of being a good neighbor, you don't want to make a mess for, for the people who live downstream of you after a rainstorm. So a few things that you can do, whether you live along the creek or not along the creek, uh, rain barrels. Rain barrels are something that collect rainwater that comes off of your house. As I mentioned, your house is an impervious area. It doesn't soak anything into the ground. So installing a rain barrel allows you to collect some of that water and use it later after the storm. This helps to alleviate high flows in the creek, but it also gives you a free source of irrigation for your yard um, or the newly planted native plants that uh, you were inspired to put in after this presentation. Uh, one little rule of thumb with a rain barrel is that a one inch rainstorm on 100 square feet of your roof will fill a typical rain barrel. So that means that if you have a 10 by 10 shed with gutters on it, you could put a rain barrel in and even that little bit of roof, you could fill up a rain barrel. So just something to, to keep in mind, you can put these on every single downspout on your house. Another thing that can be done are uh, rain gardens. So these are spots in your yard where you will actually excavate out a shallow depression. Uh, you normally try to place them near a uh, gutter downspout so you have water feeding it. Now, what these are is a spot where water can pool and you have native plants planted in there. Those native plants, as I mentioned, they promote infiltration. So you're soaking water into the ground rather than letting it run off to the street or the creek and you're helping to reduce flood flows in the stream. Therefore, you're helping to reduce erosion in the stream. We've got a couple of photos here of you know, just example of rain gardens. Uh, the one on the top left is a larger municipal rain garden that actually has uh, storm sewers feeding it and draining it. But the one on the bottom right here is in somebody's yard. And um, you know, a lot of people, they can make them blend very well with their existing landscape. Um, you don't need to have natives get really out of control or wild. You don't need to have 30 species in them. You can plant just a few flowering species that you like and let them start soaking water into the ground. There's a couple more examples of some. Uh, the one on the left has more different species in it. And then the one on the right here has just a couple species and they incorporated a couple uh, shrubs into there as well. Nothing that says you can't put a tree or a uh, bush inside of a rain garden. Now, as I mentioned before, these native plants, they are highly drought tolerant once they get installed. They promote infiltration. They don't require fertilizer, so you're not, you don't have to worry about washing nutrients into Mahoney Creek, and they hold soil in place. Uh, another thing that I had talked about were these invasive plants. Uh, invasive plants are species that are not native to Illinois, and typically when they start a, um, population, they become a monoculture, meaning they will dominate and choke out other species in the area. Two of the big problem ones that we noted along Mahoney Creek are honeysuckle and European buckthorn. So if you go to any single point along the stream, you're very likely to find these two species. Um, I know currently honeysuckle with these red berries, uh, they're starting to berry, produce berries right now. Uh, their bark looks very similar to this, and this presentation will be posted on the city's website so you can uh, come back and look at these images. And then buckthorn has a, a couple of images here of their leaves, their berries, and the bark. Uh, one way to clearly identify buckthorn is that if you go up to it and scratch off the top surface of the bark, it has an orangey, rusty color underneath it. Uh, another good way of identifying these plants is that if you're at uh, Thanksgiving dinner and you look out your window and you see green leaves on the understory of the forest behind your house, it's likely invasive brush. There are not really any native plants around here that are green towards the end of November and December. And these two species stay green sometimes all the way into like mid to late um, December. So if you have these on your property and you can, uh, please cut them down, remove them, do not throw them into the stream. Uh, dispose of them appropriately, please. 
All right, so after this presentation, I really hope you're motivated to go out and uh, incorporate some native plants into your yard. And you may be wondering, what are some good species that we can include? Uh, so Steve with AES, being the expert ecologist that he is, he was kind enough to put together a couple uh, tables here of species that you could plant and incorporate into what you have. Um, so these are for a yard that receives full sun or mostly sun. And then for a yard that has a lot of shade. As I mentioned, these will be posted on the city's website. And then also, if you're looking to introduce a new tree or a shrub into your landscape, here are a few good uh, recommendations. Okay, uh, the next steps in our study, they include uh, identifying improvements on a reach by reach basis, and in some cases, a specific project. Uh, going through and identifying stakeholders, people who we would want to partner with to actually implement uh, any of these improvements. Uh, we're developing a plan to prioritize which portions of the stream really need attention sooner rather than later. Uh, again, these depend on if the stream is in extremely poor condition, if the area is already accessible, and if it would be a potential candidate for grant funding. Uh, as I mentioned, we're identifying funding sources. And we are planning a uh, follow-up presentation to the uh, Committee of the Whole in August of this year, so uh, about a month from now. So with that, um, we can begin our Q&A section of uh, this presentation. So um, as we had mentioned at the beginning, on the right, there is a, a chat bar if you drop that down. If you have questions, you can please type them into there. I'll type an uh, example here. Or there is an option to uh, raise your hand there, and we can unmute your microphone and um, let you ask the, the question over audio. I just want to thank Logan for the presentation right now. And as Logan mentioned, you can ask questions now. And if you don't think of any, I just made the presentation live on the city's webpage. It's the same page that you went to go um, and find this link for the presentation. It's a little bit further down in the watershed study. So it is now active and live up there. Um, and if you don't think of a question right now, but one comes to you in the next couple days, months ahead, feel free to send me an email and um, either myself or the team that is here tonight can answer those questions for you. We, we do have a couple of people with their hands raised, and I'll go down in alphabetical order if that's okay. Uh, I have uh, Mr. David, and pardon me if I mispronounce your name, uh, Grudel. Um, okay, you should be free to, to uh, speak. Hello? Is hear me okay or yes we yes, hear you can, david okay great uh yeah thank you so much logan for the presentation and andrea uh you guys for putting this together um i live at uh on hansen court which is uh we have the creek literally flowing right in our backyard uh which we really enjoy um and uh i lee lukaszewski is a uh, a neighbor of ours he lives on hansen street and um he's sort of been uh, the point person for a lot of us who live along the creek area um, and um, he has graciously asked me to kind of sort of assume that role um, to be sort of a I don't know liaison is probably too fancy of a word for it but uh, just a point person to help communicate with the you know with the city off and on uh, about concerns so uh, really appreciate the presentation I thought this was great um, it's it's nice to see a plan um, and I I, I, I feel like um, it's very encouraging to see how you guys are embracing uh, natural solutions to a lot of these problems um, as opposed to uh, just more channelization um, and uh, um, you know construction uh, again so um, one question I did have uh, I know uh, Logan you talked a, a little bit about um, a happy stream as a meandering stream I think was to kind of to kind of paraphrase your um, what you said in the uh, the presentation um, is there a plan in any of these identified projects to add natural meanders back in to the, uh, in, into some of the stream flow where this channelization has happened? 
you know, looking back at those at those maps, um, you know, I see that we've kind of, you know, the 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 watershed itself, the hydrology has actually changed quite a bit from, uh, you know, the the pre-settlement times. Um, so would, would natural meandering be part of these projects uh, going forward or do you see it being more kind of like detention basins and removing uh, culverts and things like that that are more construction based? Okay, so that is a, is a very good question. Um, so meandering, as I mentioned, is it's a natural process uh, and it's a process that occurs typically, you know, to help a stream manage its slope. If a if the soil that a stream is flowing through can't handle a stream going straight through it and quickly, it will actually make itself longer by meandering. Mm -hmm. So you're just making itself longer, it's slowing itself down. Uh, since Mahoney Creek is pretty tightly bounded by homes in many instances, uh, doing a full meandering restoration is not always feasible. Understood. If a big, open, yeah. big open area, ideally, yes, that, that is a, a great way to restore a waterway. Um, but when it is constricted by people's backyards, um, typically what we would do is actually control the slope of the stream by installing those riffles that were um, in a couple of the pictures that I showed there, where rather than controlling the slope of the stream by going long back and forth, you're allowing it to kind of drop down stairs in basically small waterfalls. Um, so you can introduce small meanders where feasible, but if it's not feasible and we need to do basically a vertical meander is one way of thinking about it, we would install okay. a few okay. of the riffles. So the riffles are kind of the sort of the counter, they're, they're sort of the alternative on that though too. But, but once again, that is, a, that is a naturalized intervention, you know, that's being used in that case as well. Yep. Right? Basically, yeah. Right? Yes. Uh, I, I do have some other questions, but I, I know other people probably do, so I don't want to monopolize okay. this. Um, so I, you know, feel free to move on from me. I can always talk later or with other people at another time. So thank you. Okay. And also, if we if we do run out of time, feel free to email your questions and we can uh, respond to those. Sure, yeah. sure. Okay, so there was uh, another person or two. Let me go down the list. Uh, is it your Jurgen Clicker, let me see if I can allow you to speak. Are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm here. That will be me. Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks for everything here, first, first and foremost. Uh, thanks for doing this for us. Um, my question is, we are looking at a bunch of water retention ponds in our uh, uh, backyards, and I am always wondering, how are those connected to that creek? OK. Um, so most retention basins that uh, are within the watershed, mm -hmm. you will see likely a storm sewer basin or a storm sewer pipe coming in at one end and another one draining out at the other end. So if it is not immediately along the stream, the ponds are connected through pipes underground and they eventually make their way into the creek. Uh, the way that these detention ponds work is that the pipe coming out is smaller than the one going in. So it's, um, you can kind of imagine your bathtub. If you filled it very, very quickly, it would be controlled on how fast it can drain out by the size of your pipe leaving. Uh, so that's really what these detention ponds that you see are doing. Um, my guess is, is that you live in uh, Johnson Woods, if you can see them in your backyard. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yes, yeah, so those are connected uh, with storm sewer pipes into the basin, if I'm remembering correctly. I think we did those see uh, those connection points. The reason I'm asking is, is there a way to improve the way the uh, um, um, algae and, and uh, 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 green coverage of the uh, water level uh, can be drained into the uh, creek without hurting the creek? Oh, to, okay, so the, the water quality of the pond itself? Yeah, it's green, it's absolutely green and stinky. So <laughs> at the end of so. <laughs> wait, so there there are a few things um that you know you and all your neighbors can do. Uh, that that algae is spurred on by the use of uh, fertilizer on on lawns. Mm -hmm. Um, so everyone in your neighborhood, all your lawns, the runoff makes its way into that pond. Um, so any fertilizer that you apply that doesn't get locked into the soil will run off and end up in that pond. 
and fertilizer, will it be on your grass or in water? It promotes plant growth. Um, so that is one thing that you can do to help. Uh, installing rain gardens to actually reduce water getting into the pond can help because you're catching you know, any fertilizer that would be in that water and soaking it in on your property. Uh, another few things that can be done on ponds. Um, so those those are private basins. They're they're owned and operated by your HOA. Um, uh, some things that are sometimes considered are aeration to keep the water moving. Um, but in the instance of those basins behind your house, uh, they were designed to have a permanent pool to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't believe we could just drain them out. Um, I'd have to look at the how they were designed. But uh, there there are things that you can do to help prevent that algae. Um, Steve, do you do you have any other recommendations that they could possibly do? Um, so how do we know how deep the detention pond is? No. Any idea? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> yeah. So if if it's less than a couple feet deep, um, it's it, there's basically um, nothing much that can be done because it needs to be eight to ten feet deep. Um, to reduce the algae and aerators probably need to be um, put in as well, along with um, alum to treat the algae. But um, it's if it's if it's shallow, it's probably always going to have some amount of algae and aquatic plants growing in it. Unfortunately, um, to answer your question. All right. Thanks. Steve, I was able to um, quickly pull up the engineering plans. There's a, a five feet from the high water to the normal water. Yeah, so that's that's not deep enough to support an open water system that's going to be um, free of algae and aquatic plants. There's little pockets, though, that do go like five feet below that, but they're at the far um, east and west sides on the north basin that is on Johnson Woods Drive. So they're just very tiny little pockets. Okay. We do have a couple other folks I see with their hands raised. Um, we will move on uh, to, uh, is it Mr. Lee Lukaszewski? That's really, really close. Nice job. <laughs> Um, thank you for the presentation, Logan, and uh, we just, uh, we appreciate it. And I'm glad this is recorded because my wife is going to want to watch it as well. And, um, you know, uh, I'm representing, I'm speaking for the neighbors on Hanson Street. So we are the street that is just east of Redant going up to Viking. Where, so basically we're in front of the Shanahan Dam behind Wild Park retention, Detention Pond. And so I appreciate this. And we have been implementing in our yard a lot of these suggestions. And so we're on board with it. We want to help. Most of our neighbors do. But what we want to really see addressed, and I've mentioned this for, so for some of you, it's going to be, I'm going to sound redundant, but I feel like for the sake of our neighbors and the sake of the immediate protection of our homes, I still need to say it. We are in flood risk. You just pointed that out in your presentation. And every year now, it's not just an act of God, it's every year we risk flooding. And so we have five or six houses on Hanson up to Viking that we're asking that this be made a priority because we no longer want to be responsible for the financial cost it is on our basements because we have to respond to our basements after it's been contaminated with sewer water. The flooding does not come from the creek. It overflows into the sewer. The sewers come up our uh, up through our basement piping. We have to cut out drywall. We have to do all those things to sterilize again. What we're asking for, the neighbors here, is I know you have to make priorities. We're asking that there be priorities made, especially the things that we can do now. This last flooding season, we are hoping that there would be city people who make decisions out watching what was taking place. We were watching a waterfall of water coming down Viking Street that couldn't get into the detention pond. So it went down Viking into Hanson and completely filled, filled all the rain sewer drains or storm drains. 
which were not cleared out. And so, sorry again, but these are things that we can do immediately to partner better, is that we could have had city employees um, cleaning these drains out. Instead, it was myself and a police officer. So one encouragement and admonishment is, let's do better in the partnership. If we're asking for partnership, we wanna see the city help keep our basements dry. And then we know that a lot of that is water coming in from the elevated areas above us, south and west. And we, you spoke to that about the Fermilab. We understand that changes need to take place, but right now our neighbors are flooding because the detention pond, the levee's breaking and all the scrap and the mulch from the park district now is coming down into people's yards. That's not our responsibility. And so I'm saying this needs to get up, um, up the ladder where we're gonna get a commitment. Um, and uh, I hate to, sh to say all that stuff and then run, but I actually gotta go to another meeting in about five minutes. <laughs> but again, I just wanna, I wanna close by saying, I think we're still waiting for the city to say, yes, this is important because we're at a place on Hanson Street where we no longer are gonna ask we're not going to take it for the team. We're going to ask the city if we keep flooding like this uh, to help to compensate us. Um, so sorry to dump all that on you, Logan. I saw Andrea took off, but uh, <laughs> I just wanted to, to reiterate, that's what we're looking for in Hanson Street, and that we raised the priority, but we're on your team. We want to help with the vegetation. My wife and I are working on that, and we're going to continue to work with you. So thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, anyway, Lee, you, you touched on uh, a few things there. Um, where you're saying after after you have a flood event, you know, when the water comes up, you're left having to clean up a lot of debris in your backyard. Um, that no, does in my basement. Well, I mean, I mean, along the stream, if, if oh yes, the mulch yes, and things like that are are landing there. Um, yep. You know, that, that goes back to the residents upstream of you in the watershed. Um, no, we that's are not ever in the watershed. Everyone in the watershed, anything that ends up in that creek ends up somewhere else if it gets uh, carried I, downstream. And can I correct you? Can, let me correct you right there, Logan, real quick. So um, the park district um, had taken down some trees in Wild Park, and the mulch that ended up in all the yards on Hanson Street were from the park itself. Uh, it was all identified. They took responsibility for it, and they did a great job. They came out and cleaned it. But you're right. There are, when we flood, we get neighbors uh, firewood, <laughs> we do, uh, mm -hmm. but it happens from time to time. But we've got, we got immersed with mulch from Wild Park because the levee broke because the uh, detention pond was overfilled. So uh, you can check with the park district, they acknowledged it, they uh, helped clean up some of that mulch, but that's what the abundance of it was this last spring. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Thank you. We have about 10 more minutes left, and then we're going to have to call this presentation as um, we have another meeting to attend as well. Um, so, Howard, if there's still any other people that have their hands up, and then Logan, there's also a question in the chat bar. There are. There's about, I see about three hands still up, so I'm just going through the first pass. Um, okay. So let me continue with that if that's okay. And uh, we have, uh, is it Stephanie? I don't know if I want to try and pronounce this. Riche? Are you there? Hello? Yes, hello. Hi, My name is Daniel Rishi. My wife is Stephanie Rishi. We live, okay. on, yeah. we live on Manchester Avenue. Um, near the intersection of Hart, uh, Hart and Pine, so just south um, or just west of Hart and Pine and a little bit south. Um, the reason that we came today, we, we fall into the, we were concerned about um, flooding uh, in our yard um, that comes uh, from unincorporated Batavia area into our neighbors and into our yards that may be similar to the last commenter um, floods our backyard and our basement of us and several of our neighbors on Pine Street. We've invested in, in 
uh, in uh, uh, anti-flooding in our yard, even in playing a, a drain underground. But several times a year, I would say we receive enormous amounts of water in our yard, um, pooling amounts of water that that floods our basement of us and also our neighbors. Um, we talked with uh, a civil a city engineer, I believe his name is Rahat, about those concerns, and we were uh, it was indicated that we were on the list of things. How can we find out about more about what can be done to prevent the flooding in our yard or um, if if there's any possibility if the city's at all concerned about that or so uh daniel considering um since you've already spoken to the city and this is a, a pretty um you know individualized question uh would you mind if we talk after the presentation um just okay. concerning this regarding your your own individual lot um, it's not only uh, concerning it, it, it is concerning us it's also concerning six houses along Pine, uh manchester avenue Daniel, this is Andrea. Um, I am aware of the area and I know Rahat and I believe John has also been out there even just this spring and talking to a bunch of the neighbors over there. It is on our list of areas of concern. So um, if you want to email me again afterwards and Rahat's on the line just listening, um, we'd be happy to discuss this and some more options as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So now we have uh, uh, Victor Kuchler. Kuchler. Uh, Vic Kuchler, yes. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Me? Yes. Yep. Uh, actually, I'm uh, Jurgen, who spoke a couple minutes ago. I'm his. Uh, I'm his neighbor. He's two doors down from me. We both live on the Johnson Woods uh, retention pond. And I'm on the board of the of the Johnson Woods Homeowners Association, so I'm not going to take up a lot of time. But I I note that this MC11 sector of Mahoney Lake is basically what runs through our lot number 79. Lot number 79 encompasses the pond and most of the creek, uh, yep. at least in stretch from Wilson Street to where it uh, turns into uh, the lots on Redant Road. Um, and so I have a lot of questions, but I don't wanna take up the time now. Logan, is there a way that I can speak with you directly and we can discuss this and try to figure out um, what might be planned for that? I mean, if it's, if it's a big project, uh, you know, it, it does we have two areas that are common areas that go down to the pond but that doesn't get to the creek mm -hmm. so that would be uh, an issue for us and i'd like to then Thanks. talk to the board and try to figure out after i talk with you so if there's a way we can do that i'd really appreciate it yeah, vic as yeah, yeah. i had mentioned and logan mentioned um we're still finalizing some items this was an educational piece and um, logan's still working on potential projects and prioritizing them and those will be presented at the Committee of the Whole meeting on Tuesday, August 11th. Um, I do believe he has indicated some um, ideas for that area, but if you want, I think I have your email address here. Um, I can pass it along to Logan as well, and you guys can communicate back and forth um, on some ideas, but it isn't gonna be finalized until beginning of August. Yeah, you have my email address because I sent it back on the survey. So if you can get back with me, Logan, I'd appreciate it. And we can find a way to talk. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you. Okay, I've got a couple other folks who haven't spoken yet. Um, I am going to Laura and Randy Christensen one or the other are you there you need to unmute your microphone got there it go. thank you right. we can um, hear you. good 
this was a lovely presentation. We live on Pine Street at the top of Pine Street. Um, a, a couple of things that I wonder about uh, is, is there a chance that the city of Batavia and the park district might partner in some way to present a little more detail into some of the native plant options and um, and ideas for those of us who live along the watershed. And the second is where we go down Pine Street onto Redant, it's, it's very cluttered and you, and you can hardly even tell that the creek is there. I wonder if there's a chance that it could maybe be just cleared a little bit and the signage that's there, because there is a little bit of signage, would be more visible because it really is a lovely area and people driving by, if they saw it, might be more inclined to be interested in it. I will um, start off by saying I have to figure out exactly where um, on the creek there are portions that are owned by the park district and maintained by them. There are lots of portions that are individual property owners that encompass that. Um, and Logan presented uh, those charts of native plants that are very helpful. And um, they're lovely, but you know, a little more detail, a little so, more time than just a slide would be helpful for some. No, and it, that's what I'm getting at. Usually um, in the spring, I do have the Conservation Foundation um, come in and do a presentation on rain gardens and rain barrels. This year we had to cancel it. Um, and I know they do offer some online and I believe Steve from AES would also be able to help. There's usually booklets and stuff. I know um, the conservation at home will come to your home and walk the site, walk your property with you and give you ideas as well. And there's no charge to do that. That's um, lovely, that's lovely. Even if that just could be added to the Batavia um, magazine in the spring, just so that, because I'm not, I was not aware of those options. And so if those could be a little better publicized, then maybe more of us would take advantage of them. Okay, I can work um, on it for next spring. And Andrea, I would like to second that. Um, I participate in the Conservation at Home program. Uh, so when I started, the Conservation Foundation sent a representative out and they, they look at your property and do actually give you recommendations for things you could do to improve it. Um, you know, they'll help identify, this is buckthorn, this is honeysuckle, but this is a native type, don't cut it down, that type of thing. Um, there are not really any native types that I saw along uh, Mahoney <laughs> Creek, but, um, you know, they, they do give you pretty good individualized attention. Well, and so the whole rain garden idea stuff. is very intriguing as well, so just right. looking for a little more information. Thank you. This was lovely. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, Jody Better Betterwitz. Um, we only have a, a couple of moment, couple of minutes Here. left. I have a couple, just one question, and that is, um, we are in MCO3 on Kickapoo Avenue, and you actually showed a picture of our backyard. It was the one where the storm drain pipe had fallen off. I was wondering if that's something I should be concerned with. Is that something that's on a list of things to fix? It's on a list of things to be fixed because I came out with Logan um, twice and got to that point at least once with him and noted that. So um, I will we'll follow up. It's as you're aware, because it's your yard, it's a little difficult sometimes to get back to those locations, but it has been made aware to the streets department. Yes, and we will help with that in any way we can to help the city get through the backyard. Um, also, I noticed you had all those boulders. Is there any place we can get boulders? Big rocks? Because we need a lot of them. Oh, Where for um, yeah, like uh, riprap for the end of uh, storm sewers and things like that? Well, um, we have um, about a 10 foot drop from our yard into the creek, and it's undercut now to the point where we're going to lose another one to two feet, probably with the next rain, including trees and shrubs. So we have brought in a horticulturalist who has cleared out our yard of all the native, all invasive species and started uh, putting in um, native species. 
but we we do have this problem with the huge drop off and i like what you what you had with the the um what you call it the, the graduated slope but um i don't know if that would be done here but i so i'm thinking about we would like to do something in the meantime maybe put in some rocks so i will um, add logan showed on mahoney creek us uh, i think it's reach eight right off of forest on marshall court those were um it bends there and does a 90 degree bend the previous homeowners they got plans and they stabilized that with rocks on their own um, i'm not the city is still in the process of that as mentioned some of the creek goes to the property line um, so some of this does fall on the homeowner to maintain um, but we are that's it's part of the process we're looking at while we finalize this report Logan, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I, I am actually familiar with your property because when we were walking through it, I thought it looked very nice, the work that you've been doing so far with the uh, vegetation management there. Um, one thing I would like to note for, for everybody in general, um, clearing vegetation uh, the way that Jody has on her property where she's removed the invasive brush and restoring native plants, that is a very good thing to do. Um, but when we get into the condition where we're starting to place stone uh, at uh, like in the water um, right at the edge of the bank um, that does require permitting because the stream is also uh, it's governed by the army corps of engineers and the idnr uh, it's a regulated floodway so i would recommend jody before you do that uh, to please talk with andrea a little bit more about permitting requirements um, the work you've been doing so far is great, but I, I just don't want you to get into a, a situation with some of the other uh, permitting agencies where they, you know, write you a letter or something like that. Yeah, no, I don't want to get in trouble either. <laughs> and that property I mentioned, I did work with the engineer that that resident hired um, to get through the permitting process because they did get that permit that was required by the DNR. Okay, thank you. It is uh, 6.47. Um, okay. We have one other person I see. Uh, I don't know if you want to take that or... Unfortunately, I'm going to have to call it because both Rahat and I are sitting at Public Works. We need to make it to City Hall for a 7 o'clock presentation. Okay. Um, so whoever is left, if you want to go ahead and email me, my email is on this slide, a pedraza at cityofbatavia.net. And um, either myself or Logan give you a call back or respond to your email. And I want to thank everyone for attending and hope you guys got some useful information out of this. And like I said, the next presentation will be August um, 11th at the Committee of the Whole meeting. And folks, it should take about a day or two before this presentation is made available on our website. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is that it? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.